Is our house burning? And if the reason for for that question or, the, or, or what it means isn't clear, it will become clear uh, very shortly. Um, I'd like to start off um, by just reminding everyone about a couple of small housekeeping things. Um, first of all, if this is your first time at one of these meetings, welcome. Um, if you're a regular attender, then welcome back. It's great to see you again after the summer. Uh, we're delighted to be able to start up this series of Coffee with Emble sessions, and uh, feel free to join us in a cup of uh, coffee. The screen is showing it there. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, our, our three uh, panelists. Rather than speaking, we'll say panelists. Um, uh, perhaps they could just do a wave or a shout out. Uh, Lucia um, from EMBL, who's here from sunny Boxburg. Hello, everyone. Also, Georgia, uh, who some of you remember as a, as a prize winner from the, uh, the, the World Day. Georgia is joining us from Switzerland and hopefully is, uh, is still on the screen and waiting. Um, it's such a large number of faces, I, I, I couldn't see everyone. And also, um, uh, Freddie from downtown Heidelberg. Hi, Freddie. So, we will be hearing from all of them. Um, we'll be uh, having a discussion around that. And we have this theme for today of, is our house burning? And that's something very relevant and very topical within the EMBL uh, that uh, Lucia is going to be telling you more about how that relates to uh, uh, EMBL's uh, thinking and, and a big conference that's coming up and what it means. Uh, and so just to, to kick the ball off, we're going to uh, start with a question. We're going to have a bunch of questions. We're going to start with a question um, which Peter's going to uh, put up uh, on, on the screen. And we're very interested in your responses and also whether anyone changes their opinion um, over the course of the next hour or more. Uh, about the answer to this. So the question we're going to ask is, as scientists, should we be activists? Peter, can you uh, ask people? And you should see on your screen um, uh, a chance to uh, respond, yes or no. That's the question. Um, what's the role of, of, of science? Should, should they be activists? And I'll be very interested um, to, to see um, whether anyone changes their opinion about that or uh, if it's influenced by uh, what we hear in this discussion today. So with no more further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Lucia to tell us about whether our house is burning. Thank you. So yeah, thank you very much for having me back uh, to the copy session. Um, this time it's on Science and Society. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Lucia. I'm the Science and Society Manager here at EMBL. And our Science and Society program, which has been running for over 20 years now, um, examines the ethical, legal, and social implications of scientific research more generally, but um, also of EMBLES uh, in, in particular. Um, and how do we do this? Well, um, it's really a very holistic end-to-end -end approach from internal interrogation of the topic all the way through to external outreach and engagement and, and many, many steps in between. Um, and we do that generally by theme. I'm going to share my screen with you now so you can have a little bit more of an idea of what we're talking about. Um, here we go. So we do this by theme. Um, generally, we do it around ethics, technology, data, people, planet. It's by no means exhaustive, but this gives you a bit more of an idea of, of the breadth, really, of the subjects it covers. And if you want to hear more about this kind of detail, I'll actually be discussing that side of things at the HHMI-run sister seminar series on Wednesday. So we're going to park all of that stuff for today, and we're going to be focusing much more on, on the upcoming conference. Um, so the sort of activities we do around these topics range from internal discussion meetings or roundtables to those external seminars and conferences. Um, so although science and society has this element of comms or event management, I think really at the heart of it, it's much more of an interrogatory um, analytical function. And when I see the ethical, legal and social implications or the LC of scientific research, I really mean the context in which research operates. And none of us, none of the research exists in a vacuum. And so that context is absolutely essential when it comes to 
exploring how we can work with and for society. So um, today I'm going to interrogate all of you, not only our special guests, but all of you and Angus as well. Um, we're going to focus on the flagship external outreach event, which is our Science and Society Conference. Um, this year it focuses on mass extinction. And um, we are starting with the history of mass extinction and examining the twin crises of climate change and loss of biodiversity across different ecosystems, but also crucially to focus on potential solutions, um, be they societal or scientific or technological. And part of that process is really the role of the scientist in this debate. Um, if you haven't signed up yet, please do. There's a flat fee of 20 euros and it's also absolutely free for high school students. Um, the deadline's in about three weeks. So time is of the essence and we need you to spread the message and really to add different types of voices to the debate. We really, really need more young people, high school students in particular, to take part. Um, we've actually created a couple of videos, four videos to be precise, um, for you really to retweet and bring those issues to life. So Peter, I wonder if we can play two of those now before I go on to the question part of my presentation. This is Victor De Lorezo from Madrid, and I really encourage you to become involved in the event that is being organized in EMBL Heidelberg on how science and molecular biology in particular can help addressing some of the most pressing problems that we face as society and as humanity, and namely how to deal with climatic change and how to deal with the impact that our activities have in the entire biosphere. So for a long time, molecular biologists have been interested mainly in the small world, but now in the last few years, we have the capacity to really address with the tools that come from advanced biology, advanced science, advanced systems biology, synthetic biology, many of the issues that so far were untractable. And I hope that this discussion will open the window for new actors and new partners to really become involved in this big mission about restoring our environment and making our planet a livable place. Hi, my name's Frank Pope. I'm the CEO of Save the Elephants, a research and conservation organization based here in Kenya. Elephants are landscape engineers or architects. Their presence or their absence shapes entire ecosystems. Yet over the last two and a half thousand years, Demand for ivory has wiped them out from vast swathes of the African continent. I mean, modern humanity has been responsible for the extinction of other large charismatic mammals and the same fate threatened elephants. Thankfully, for elephants there's hope because there's been a, a huge global response to the crisis uh, that has seen the ivory trade put onto the back foot and in retreat. The long-term future of elephants is gonna be decided by whether we can find ways for elephants and humans to live side by side in harmony. For that coexistence to happen in an increasingly crowded Africa, we're gonna need deeper understanding and a scientific understanding of elephants. How do they make decisions? What, which of their behaviors could we transform into, into tools to help benefit them? How do elephants respond to a crisis? How do they recover from, from the sort of mortality they've been suffering? And in fact, what do wild elephants even need to survive and to thrive? Well, I hope that you can join all of us at the Science and Society Conference in November and hear more about elephants and what they can teach us about extinction in a world that's increasingly dominated by man's influence. So, yeah, going back to the PowerPoint presentation, um, to this last slide that I'm going to leave you with, really, um, and going perhaps back a step, I'm, you know, I'm jumping the gun a bit, really, um, I'm already asking you to be part of this event, to disseminate the message, to make sure we you know, have our voices spread across different audiences, to inform the debate and to help us consider really one of the, arguably one of the most important challenges of our time. But is that actually your job 
as a scientist? Is there a duty to engage the external world on scientific issues? Or does it muddy the water to have an agenda? Um, so today we're going to talk about exactly that. And I'd like our contributors to start with the environmental questions, as we've mentioned here, um, and to keep it on the topic of mass extinctions and climate change to start, whether that's their, their area of expertise or not. Um, the science, the fake news, and the movements of people and planet. Um, and could or should scientists speak out on issues about which they're knowledgeable or not at all knowledgeable? Um, or should one remain neutral um, to keep your head down, to get on with the science? And then I think it would be really valuable to think about whether this is this applies to other sectors and is transferable to different issues. So to really consider that wider question of a scientist's role in society, uh, whether that's changed perhaps in recent, recent decades. So um, I think before we start, we'd like to ask a question not only to Freddie and to Georgia, but also to everyone else out there. And, be, and, and I'm sure Angus will encourage you to, to contribute your ideas too. Let's start off with, should you as a scientist, should one as a scientist, adopt a position on mass extinction or climate change, or should you remain neutral? And uh, Does it really matter if it's your area of expertise or not? Do you think you should have a voice and put your head above the parapet? So I look forward to everyone's point of view, and I'd like to hand over really to Freddie and to Georgia to, to get their opinion on this. So Georgia, what, what do you think? You know, um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, first of all, thank you for having me again. Um, and I think it's a very, very interesting question. I, I, I think that scientific objectivity should not stop researchers from standing from, uh, for what they believe in. Um, you know, as Lucia mentioned, uh, you know, science doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, and we need to understand that science is a human endeavor, uh, you know, it's made by people, scientists are people, uh, they see, you know, injustice and, um, you know, as, as everyone sees, sees it, as the rest of the world sees it, um, you know, they see the problems that, uh, you know, climate change of mass extinctions could, uh, you know, the consequences of climate change on the, on life, on the, on this planet as we know it. So, um, I think that for a long time, scientists thought that, you know, just by being scientists, they were doing good, they were helping people. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that, you know, by not having a place in policy, um, you know, scientists cannot really help people. You know, if they don't speak up, if they stay silent when, uh, you know, governments or other actors like, um, you know, including other scientists, misuse scientists, a science to, you know, to benefit from it or to... Um, you know, to put forward harmful, harmful ideas or uh, policies, uh, you know, they are not helping people. Um, and, and we saw it, you know, with Trump, science um, has not just been ignored, it has been directly attacked. He just said a couple of days ago that he thinks that science doesn't know, uh, you know, about whether the, our planet is getting hotter. And um, so, you know, this, this, you know, climate change, um, you know, mass extinction, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, these are just, uh, you know, threats to the lives, the livelihoods, uh, of not, not just of Americans, but, you know, you know, everyone on this planet. So um, it was... So Georgia, uh, could, could, could I just uh, uh, um, come in and, and responding to the, the chat group, um, following up on, on a question, on a comment that I think probably quite a lot of people would have, but I noticed Graham Tebb has has made it here. First of all, we should probably ask ourselves now, from someone like yourself who's become now a very prominent um, uh, person uh, with a scientific training, interacting with the media and, and making a profession of communicating science to a broad audience, what is a scientist? And what, why should they be special or have, a, have an opinion? Yeah, I mean, there is, uh, I think, the tendency, maybe it's a wrong tendency of people uh, that people have to see, uh, you know, scientists as magicians. <laughs> uh, you know, like we look at climatologists to, to solve climate change and we look at virologists to save us from the coronavirus pandemic. So, uh, you know, these are problems uh, that cannot be, you know, only addressed by scientists. Of course, these are problems that need to be addressed by all of us, uh, you know, governments, uh, policymakers, people, uh, you know, citizens. Um, so science can inform people's uh, responses, 
but it will not determine people's responses. So um, that's, that's the, I think, the key message that, that should pass, that maybe it's not uh, something that people, um, you know, widely believe. And I think, you know, for me, you know, scientists have three main roles. So one is, of course, generate knowledge, teach that knowledge to, to students, and, uh, you know, translate that knowledge for uh, the public because, because that's how they can inform uh, people's responses to, to problems such as climate change or, uh, you know, pandemic. Um, and, you know, now, especially now, you know, that we are in a time of uncertainty, you know, we really bring, need to, to bridge this, uh, you know, the scientific knowledge to the practi- practical decisions that people have to, have, have to make. And um, so that, you know, that brings another question. So is how can scientists communicate what they do, uh, with, what they do not know, because sometimes, you know, scientists do not know about uh, things. Uh, you know, for, for policymakers, how can policy be informed by, yeah. by certain science? So I'm not sure uh, what you know. That, that's a, that's a very interesting point, and and again, I, I'm I'm just being, so I think it was Graham again who who, who uh, po- posted a comment on this that something that can um, perhaps reflect laziness on the behalf of the media is they often will find a favorite scientist that they feel is able to speak in front of a camera. And then they ask them to comment on maybe originally on something that's their specialist area. But then in the future, it's like whatever the topic is vaguely called science, the same person is brought back and expected to comment on, you know, almost anything, including topics that they probably know know more about than perhaps uh, they do about uh, medieval art history or something else. But they're, they're a media-friendly personality. I think yeah, so it's quite interesting to hear your own thoughts about that, uh, Georgia. But I'd like to come back to that in a second. And bring Freddie in again. I mean, um, sorry, bring, bring, bring Freddie and also to, to, to comment on on this because um, it, it's a concern sometimes that you have the media scientist who who is just given the title scientist, but is then expected to have an opinion. And for me, it sort of raises a really interesting, important question. To what extent does society and politicians make decisions on important issues on the basis of data? As scientists, we normally try to make our decisions or test our hypotheses by framing questions, and then we, we will uh, you know, face up to the answers based on the measurements or data we acquire. I'm not sure that public debates often work that way. Freddie, what, what do you think about that? How is it here? Yeah, so cer- certainly public debates don't work that way, right? Uh, it's not not evidence that uh, is based uh, is the basis of everything. I see this very self critically by myself. I really wanted the schools to reopen, right, so that I get rid of my kids and I can have a life again, <laughs> right? And that overruled every scientific credibility I had, right? And I'm I'm willing to say that, and oh, this is recorded, right? So I mean, be careful. But uh, th- you know, I, I just admit that as a scientist, you're not without feelings and without um, um, without preconceived ideas. I think there is two underlying questions that we need to always ask ourselves. One is, everyone, whether scientists or not, of course, has a certain number of rights, uh, but also a certain number of duties. And my observation with people is that also with scientists is everybody knows their rights much better than their duties. Um, and that's just you know a very general thing. So maybe we should very we, if if we're in doubt, we should rather feel that maybe we should bring something more to society than we do. Right? At, at the same time, I guess it's everybody's right to not have an opinion on everything, and also to fundamentally not care about something. Right? I guess that that's a right. Well, same time, if people have the feeling that something goes horribly wrong, I do think it's their absolute duty to speak up, whether they're scientists or not. So I like Graham's question on what is a scientist, right? Is, is that an intellectual or, or whatever? And I think as a scientist, um, you need to know certain things. And I find that, as you said, we have hypotheses and then we test them. A lot of a lot of scientists are not even aware of that very simple principle. They usually want to prove their hypothesis, right? They don't want to test them. Um, and then a lot of scientists, they don't know some of the very basic things about scientific discoveries. So I had students at Heidelberg University who finished their PhD. They've never heard about Homo heidelbergensis. 
I've recently asked uh, over 10 students who applied for my lab as PhD students how old the universe was. And only one had it right in the order of magnitude. Right? So, so how can you think the universe is 100 million years old if you're a scientist? Right? I, I don't get that. Because then if, if, you're, if you're a scientist but you don't know some of those very key concepts in science, uh, then I would say, well, then it's maybe better not to speak up about things that are not your very narrow focus of, of what you're doing. Yeah? Uh, but should you then be called a scientist or should you then be called a whatever it is scientist, you know, a, a, a scientist of P53 or something, right? But then please, not of anything else, right? Uh, so sorry, yeah, so, I so, so, I mean, a very important definition we have to do. I mean, I mean it, it's, it's, it's difficult when... Often debates that are incredibly important are carried out in the public domain, typically by politicians or other people with a vested interest, where the, the arguments and are made and policy decided in a way that's very different to how we tend to, to, to form theories in science or, or, or proceed or allocate resources or, 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 or do things. So, I mean, this leads to some interesting tricky questions because you want public debates to be fair and as unbiased and transparent as possible in, in democratic societies. That's typically what we want. But if you have a question like, is the earth flat or is the earth a, a spheroid? <laughs> um, that people don't all agree on that. So should you, uh, this, this is of course a simple question because I think, I suspect everyone here, if not put, say down in the comment, most of us would agree the earth is not flat not completely hit flat and, and would cite evidence. If there's a debate on, 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 on public television, should you give equal time to someone who argues the earth is flat and the earth, and you say, well, this is just a waste of time, but you shouldn't do it. But then, you know, it's not too far away to come to the question that I've seen debated, is the climate changing? Is there climate change? Is that is that being driven by human activity and should the facts cause us to change our behavior, restructure our society, reallocate public funding. And then it's a more difficult question because it clearly comes into contemporary politics. And do, do, we, do we want to give equal time to, to people uh, to express arguments that are less well supported? Than by it? So, um, Georgia, uh, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think that the you know the false ba balance is a problem that is uh, very common in 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 journalism and in science journalism, uh, in, in in particular. And I think that you know when when you have the evidence, you know, like for the flat um, flat Earth, uh, you know, that for a position that is solid and is backed up by tons of data, it's just wrong to to treat you know conflicting view as as equal. And um, but but you you should you know it should be very clear on what the point is uh, what the point of the interview the article is for example anti vaxxers if you if you talk to them you know they talk about choice rather than you know efficacy of vaccines or healthcare so I think we we should we just uh, have to be very clear as to what the discussion is uh, you know just stick to the topic are we talking about you know the data the evidence that uh, is there for you know our climate. Uh, is this changing, or are we talking about economic interests that you know can can come in at some point? Because you know many people just are not contesting the evidence of climate change. It's just that climate change you know doesn't uh, align with their values or their lifestyles or their economic interests. So it's I, I think we should be as science journalists. I don't know, if I, talk, I speak as a science journalist, we should be very clear on what the, the the topic is and avoid this false balance when we talk about facts. Um, you know, if we are talking about economic uh, issues and other um, yeah. other issues that are not scientific, um, you know, that are not backed by scientific evidence, then it's a different, um, as a different I, whole discussion. I, I guess that's one of the thorny topics as to whether what we are discussing really are facts or not. So we could say a fact is that the the speed of light is the maximum speed you can uh, that 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 can of travel in, in, in space time as we, as we understand it. And there's a, a large body of evidence to say that that seems to be correct as far as we can determine things. Other parts of, uh, of, of scientific evidence, perhaps not, not so clear. So, um, yeah, I think it can be tricky. Um, I, I think 
we have to unpack this a little bit and ask that question a slightly different way. So we are, um, many of us here are, are, are professional scientists or connected with science or have some domain knowledge relevant to some issues in the public debate, but we are also members of society. So we're entitled to have an opinion as members of society, but we can also bring some specialist views to the table. I, I'm interested to, to know if we ask the question 180 degrees around the other way, because if you're a scientist and perhaps funded by the taxpayer or, or your institution depends upon funding from politicians, should you feel that even although you have a strong opinion, you, you, you shouldn't express it because that might somehow be used to uh, negatively affect funding from the politicians for your organization? Maybe we could ask people what you think about that. Do you feel constrained not to express your opinion um, by your institutions. And if we can respond to that, or shall I answer some of this? Or I mean, I would I would say no. I don't feel at all uh, that this is a problem. But uh, I think we're pretty lucky in sort of the in Germany, the UK, and other places where there is uh, a clear science-based uh, society at, at work uh, or science-funded society at work where I think the, the lunatics are in the, in the minority. Um, but I can totally see that in the U.S. that might shift differently well, and in, in some more so if you, democratic if, if, system, that's a real problem. If, if you'll pardon a, a bad pun, the elephant in the room here is, is the uh, linking that thing from the video before is that there is a US presidential election going on and arguably science is being weaponized in this election. So, um, I mean, one interesting thing that, that emerged or, or remarkable thing that emerged last week, which I, I guess many of you may be aware of, if someone hasn't heard about it, the, the very popular science uh, journal, Scientific American, for the first time in its history, decided to take sides in a major political Debate. And I, I noticed in the in in the chat as well. Um, for example, several people are commenting. For example, uh, Margaret Burmeister w was commenting that at their institution, um, you you they don't want you speaking out during election periods. That also creates a dilemma for a scientist if there are two sides and and people are saying different things, and you may feel you know that one of them is is wrong, <laughs> is factually wrong. Should you, I mean, in the way the, sign, the editor of uh, uh, the editorial policy of Scientific American has been to say, we normally have never, never before taken sides, but we feel now we just can't sit back and, and watch this and, and, and we are taking sides. And you know, we're not taking sides here. We're not endorsing people um, one way or another. But um, how do you feel about that, Freddie? Do, do you think that, um, that that makes sense? I mean, how do you balance that issue of fairness and um, transparency? Yet, if you if you're hearing about something where you know that it, the facts are being distorted, I, I think that goes back to to what I said before. You know that scientists really need to know, and if if you if you really need to know something, then you need to stand by this. Um, so you know the 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 Earth being round or being flat, I think we shouldn't waste any more time. Then just stating that and then leaving on a beautiful example, I think, came from Italy, where they had these, uh, I can't remember, a comedian and an actress and a scientist invited to a, to a discussion on, um, I can't remember, I think it was vaccines causing problems or something, right, uh, George, are you correct yeah. me? And and then they gave, of the one hour, they gave 50 minutes to the comedian and the actress, and then they were like, there was like five minutes left for the scientist. And this wonderful colleague stood up and said, look, the earth is round, vaccines are safe, everything else is bullshit. And that's that. And he finished with this, and it caused a gigantic storm, right, and made him a superstar immediately. But I think that we should allow ourselves to occasionally say that. So I just wrote this into the comments, you know, we kill lots of animals. And yes, my institution doesn't like me to put pictures of, of dead mice on, on our website. But I, I openly talk about this, and I think it's important. People might give me heat for that, and, and that's okay, right? As long as it's in a democratically okay way, right? I'm, I'm not sure how I would react if somebody would suddenly smear my house full of 
he's a mouse killer or something, right? Um, but I think if we don't go and, and are very um, clear about why we do certain things that are maybe not so popular or why we have views that are funded in science that we might not like. You know, it's as simple as if I leave that cup of coffee out, it's not going to stay there. It's just going to go down. It's gravity, right? Uh, nobody will contest that. Um, yet it's not, I would prefer if it occasionally would just stay there if I leave it there. Uh, and it's these simple things we need to, okay, over and over explain people. But I guess that's the duty we have as scientists, right? To go and also be uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, and sometimes I mean, also be uncomfortable towards ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I'm seeing some very interesting comments and uh, coming back here again. I think Valeria uh, Poli also highlighted something I, I, I completely agree with that it, it's also really important for scientists to take the responsibility to educate people, which isn't about just telling them I'm right and you're wrong, but to help somehow clarify with a calm voice, what are facts, what are, and not just unsubstantiated opinions. But I, it's also clear that many different forces come into play. Um, I, and just uh, uh, Olivia, um, uh, who works, I believe, for the, for the NIH in the US, it was, was mentioning the comments. It'd be great to hear from Olivia how, as a, um, a government scientist in the US, you feel able to contribute if you can contribute or constrained. As a as a major uh, public debate rages with a really important decision. I mean, who gets elected head of the of the USA is massive impact actually on all of our lives, and that's true of the heads of, of most of the major European countries. But I mean, there are other issues that also come into play. Georgia, I wonder in your professional life um, as as a, a a science writer and communicator, I presume you ha you you have to write and get contracts and be paid by organizations who make money by selling books and magazines and are paid also by advertisers and organizations. Does that ever come into play? Do you feel that's a, an issue, that there's pressure to moderate the views you express? I mean, the, the places um, I work for are, I mean, the news teams are usually editorially independent from the organization. So... You know, let's say I write a, a new story for for science. Uh, you know, if it's about a, a paper, you know, that, that came out in science, I don't feel any pressure. You know, in, in publicizing it, or I don't feel any pressure in avoiding to uh, to taking it down. You know, if there are problems, I can I'm free to 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 highlight those problems. So I never felt um, that. Um, but I agree that, you know, at, for example, at NIH, uh, you know, it's really hard to get comments from scientists. Um, they, 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 you know, everything needs to, to go through the, their press office. And sometimes they're not allowed to talk to, to journalists, as I think, especially recently. Um, they are having more and more problems uh, with that. So I don't feel that, on, you know, myself. But I, I see that for some scientists, it's hard to comment, even on, you know, topics that are not controversial at all. Uh, Lucia, can I bring you back in here um, to perhaps comment on this? Now, EMBL is in an even more complex position because you don't have to deal with just one government. There are <laughs> There's a multiplicity of governments uh, which have quite different opinions. Um, and I, I think at the moment, EMBL is funded by um, governments which uh, represent the full spectrum from quite extreme right countries currently uh, with leaderships that have quite ex strong right-wing views through to more socialist agendas. Does that, does that make it harder for EMBL to, to, to have any public opinion without offending someone? <laughs> Well, I mean, I can speak certainly from the science and society perspective. I mean, perhaps we're unique in the organization is that we're meant to be a neutral facilitator. So we don't ever seek to take sides. Um, that sounds easy enough, but actually in practice, it, it can be quite difficult, um, even in the sort of climate change issues that you mentioned, to be truly um, representative of lots of different views. Does that mean that we include climate deniers in the conversation? Um, personally, I don't think so. I think um, perhaps we can exclude a group of people who are very anti-science, given that we are a scientific organisation. 
um, and, and still have an interesting debate um, about you kind know, of different aspects of climate change. So um, I think also, you know, one thing I drew from some of the comments down below was I think someone mentioned um, about you know, we say that scientists' view is, say, more important than anyone else's, for example. And this really kind of resonates with me. Not at all. I think for what I always advocate um, through this program or Ember and beyond is more voices are better, generally. I think we lack a diversity of views for so, so many different issues. And um, always, as you say, go back to either the same scientists or the same group of people, um, really kind of narrows the focus of, of the debate. And what we need is, is more people contributing. Um, to give a great diversity, I suppose, at discussion. Um, one final thing I'll end with, and, and perhaps this is back to both Freddie and Georgia, um, you both kind of mentioned perhaps that you don't feel too constrained to express your views. But I suppose, you know, um, how far does that go? It could be correcting a tweet online, maybe educating. We've seen some people in the comment session sections talking about, well, to them, activism equals disruption. It could potentially equal violence you know um how how much are you able to express your opinion and until what point is it that you you know that it is not really okay anymore to, to be really you know, outspoken and to align yourself with a particular opinion over to you freddy well so i'm in that extremely fortunate position of being a german professor which basically means if i don't do something unbelievably and utterly stupid nothing can ever happen to me Right, so uh, not everybody's in that position, you know, uh, but, but I, I don't see any restriction. I think other than if I would deny the Holocaust or something outrageously idiotic, right? Uh, you know that there, there's nothing that that can happen to you, and I think that's that's a huge freedom. And I I think there occasionally one should use this, right, to to really state to people that what they're doing is not is is not correct or what they're thinking is not correct. However, I also made the experience that, so I would not necessarily exclude climate uh, deniers from a conference on climate change, because very often there is something you can learn from these people. It's either their mental setup, right, in the in the worst case, yeah, but sometimes they do have, they do have good good points. For example, at the very early uh, days of climate change, it was always the the vanishing ice sheet of Kilimanjaro that was used as an example, and that's probably the worst example ever. Because that uh, underlies cl cl uh, uh, local climate fluctuations, the way I understood, right? And there's many of these things. Huh? So very often, then also scientists, um, you know, use the wrong examples in order to maybe explain something a little simpler, or they, they it's even propagating uh, as some type of myth within scientists. What is a good example to to talk to the public about? And and by then getting heat from people who we usually don't like to talk to, we can actually still learn things. Um, I remember having a, a Greenpeace activist once at one of the Science and Society conferences, and he was uh, first surprised to be invited because uh, he was a gene technology uh, opponent. <laughs> and and a second, he was surprised that everybody listened to him in a very uh, you know decent manner and, and that the discussion was, was a very fair discussion. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's great. I'm... Uh, Delighted you have so much um, freedom as a German professor <laughs> to be as, as crazy as you want with only a couple of special uh, sensitive areas. I, I can honestly, I'm not sure I would have had the confidence to make that statement in the UK as a professor. Um, it, maybe. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm not sure how crazy I'm allowed to be. I'm interested from people in, in some of the other uh member countries who are, who are here. Is is that also true? I don't know if that's something we could schedule Peter a vote on if you feel you've got that confidence. Um, there are some people here who are never shy about being crazy or expressing opinions. I see Gareth looking at, at me through here. Um, uh, he'd be a, a hard man to uh, uh, suppress. But, um, you know, I think that's actually, I, I'm feeling sad about saying that. But just listening to the confidence you said I can, I can, you know, I, I, I have the confidence of, of, of that security. I, I, I worry that as scientists, our positions um, are being undermined um, as things go on. And I think that's a precious confidence to have. I think we really want to safeguard people who are able to be a bit crazy because sometimes they are 
useful and the very fact that you can have an opinion that is against the the trend. I mean, maybe some experiment would reveal that the Earth was flat after all. I suspect not, but um, you know, that's that that's a ludicrous example of something else. The, the, the conventional wisdom isn't always, in the end, the correct one. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else would like to come in or, or, or comment on that. Yeah, I wanted to uh, answer uh, Nishia's question um, about opinions. I mean, as a journalist, I don't uh, express any opinion in my articles. I don't write op-eds. I write just you know news articles. So you know, my my aim is actually to find the truth. It's a bit like a a, a researcher, right? And so I I look for evidence, I look for facts, and I and I try to put them together. And um, I wanted us to. Uh, answer a comment by Graham. Um, he said uh, that science, uh, that journalists have the pressure to be provocative and to attract interest and attention. Now, I don't want to speak for all the category, of course, because I'm, you know, I'm doing my job. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, we have all uh, seen, um, you know, dramatic, misleading headlines. That's, that's not the stories I, I, I usually do. I usually cover the magazines I write for are, you know, respected scientific journals. So we don't do that, that kind of stuff. So I, I don't feel any pressure if that was, uh, uh, you know, the question, uh, you know, to be provocative. You know, I just need to find something that is relevant for people. Like, I don't know, fast tests for the coronavirus, you know, they give you results in 15 minutes. They are, they are, they are relevant. They are interesting because they are relevant. They are news sports now. And I, you know, I feel compelled to write about them now. But of course, I look at, you know, what, what the, what these tests can do, what these tests cannot do. I talk to, 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 to experts and I, you know, try to put together something that could help and it would be helpful for people to understand, you know, what these tests are about. I mean, but this could be in any. Uh, you know, field of science. I just wanted to, uh, you know, make uh, this clear about, you know, science journalism. Um, of course, the quality of science journalism vary, can vary uh, very much. So, um, so so I guess this raises another really important topic. I'd, I'd be very keen to to hear people's opinions of and also from, from, from the comments for people to uh, to contribute to us. Where, where do people get their information from to make decisions. Now, I, I came up with a silly example just to illustrate, should you have both sides equally represented? Is the earth flat or is it round? Okay, I, I said that was meant as a um, re reducing the argument to a more absurd case, although I believe there are some people who maybe do believe the earth is or would like to believe it's, it's flat. But if I can believe at least some things I read in the press, there are people in, in modern Western democracies who don't want to take a vaccine against coronavirus because they think Bill Gates is actually implanting some sort of control device. And this entire, this entire situation is manipulating society. Um, and those sort of memes or ideas, I, I mean, I worry that they are spread more effectively through social media and therefore penetrate and are affected. And they, they have been picked up and and uh, discussed on certainly on the BBC on CNN on other media major media outlets and I you know I think um, it would be very difficult for for me or possibly even for John to, to get that much exposure to, to some of you know to, to some of our opinions so I'm really interested to hear how people think about that because Facts can, I mean, access to discussing facts and to putting information in the public domain is very unequal. And, and that sort of makes, it makes me worry about our role as scientists because uh, I, I, I fear the politicians will blame scientists for not having come up with a solution fast enough for corona. I mean, at least in the UK, which I'm more familiar with. All, all the politicians say, well, we are going to be led by the, sign, by the scientists. We, we, we are going to, don't blame us if we do something you don't like, because we are led by the scientists. And yet different politicians recommend different things because they find different scientists to recommend different things. Um, so how, how do we manage that unequal access to, to the media? And what is the role then of a major organization like the preeminent European Life Sciences Organization 
um, that we all have an association with in, in EMBL. How, how can you then rise to that challenge as an organization and somehow provide some rational source of, of reliable information that, that people could turn to? Is, is that even desirable? I don't know. What do people think? Freddie, what would you think about that? You're muted. Sorry, could somebody just quickly pick it up because I didn't get sure. the question. Uh, it, it, really about, uh, yeah, absolutely. If anyone else would like to come in, or Georgia, if you'd like to comment, or please, if someone else would like to come in and comment on that. M my concern was about um, how you manage the unequal access of information. I was just illustrating how some, some, some things to me, the idea that Bill Gates is trying to implant in, in, in vaccines uh, microchips that will control us mm. is actually much less likely than the Earth being flat. That's my that's my personal opinion, um, and yet it, it's an opinion that is is reproduced and discussed on major media. So, so I, I think I try not to be worried about this. Maybe I still I'm still two years younger than you, Angus. So uh, this comes with age that one gets worried about this information, <laughs> the spread of EDC. Um, but uh, you know that the truth is that there is people who believe that the the, 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 the Earth is flat, right? And and they're not living in Papua New Guinea, where if they live there, that's okay because they haven't gotten the education. But they're living in the United States of America or in Germany, right? Uh, there's not many of them, but they are there, and. No argument that you will do with these people. No, you know, you can take them on a flight around and they will always come up with some counter argument. You can't discuss this. You just need to live that there is a certain percentage of of, of people who are ignorant um, about, you know, scientific facts uh, or or the, the truth, as I was just trying to elaborate on a private chat with Graham. Um, and if we see... And, and if you see that, how do you respond to this? I think that's that would be putting me into this balance of duty and 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 right. I think we would have totally the right to let idiots be idiots, you know, and not call it our duty to try and convince them when it costs you more effort to convince one of these people than it is to get an ERC advance grant, you know. The, but if one of the if one of the idiots you feel is running for high public office, well, and, and, uh, that, 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 then what what do you do? Um, I don't know if uh, Olivia, if, if you feel, uh, and, and and anyone else who might comment in a similar position, if you're employed um, by the by the government in any one of our countries or, 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 or other countries, if you feel that that's reasonable, that that you should be constrained to to comment, I, I, it's a, it's a very difficult. Um, it's a very difficult decision. I don't know if anyone has has a comment they'd like to make or a, a feeling about that. I think this is the reality of the situation that we that we find ourselves in. Maybe people could um, raise their hand. There is on the participants panel a button, isn't there, to raise hands, and then it would be great to unmute them. Because they can't unmute themselves. Yes. So, so in fact, that's perfect timing because we, we according to my um, watch, within one one to two minutes, we're coming to the, the official end of the hour. I can't believe how fast it's going in. Um, as I mentioned, we we have this tradition now of having a second cup, which uh, allows um, anyone who's interested to, to stay and carry on the discussion. And we hope, in particular, that that would allow any, any one of you who would like to contribute a chance uh, to say it. And I would just remind everyone, uh, we want to hear from you, but do remember we're recording it and it is a public event. <laughs> uh, um, maybe not everyone has the same confidence that Freddie has about the, <laughs> and, and, and to, to, to saying anything um, that they want. Um, okay, so sorry, I do see someone with their hand up. Um, Nush, can you, yeah, uh, can you manage that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to say, like, some people don't believe in vaccines. It's not because they don't believe in science, but it's also because uh, they have they have their information being sold uh, on the internet, and they have, you know, the government knows about why they spend their money. You know, there's all this corruption, and you know they lose their trust. Even uh, they they don't trust the scientists anymore, and um, I think to fight this. 
um, you you have mentioned that like the people here are usually like scientists and they have science backgrounds, but we also need to attract the people who have no knowledge about science so they can learn about science. And um, yeah, in order to, to gain that confidence, we just need to do more and be more um, transparent about the truth. Yeah, I, 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 would, uh, I would certainly endorse that. I think that um, second is, is, um, is probably arguing, though, that to some extent we should be activists. That doesn't mean that we go and burn cars or, or do something, but it means that you don't just stay silent, that you do actually use the opportunity to calmly present accurate factual information. I mean, I actually, that's a brilliant point. What we need to do is build up trust. And I, I'm, I'm really asking you that, it, can there be a role, if it's hard for individuals, for an organization, respected organization, perhaps EMPL would be a good example, to, to be a, a reliable source where you can have trust because they are seen to be fair. Um, I, see, I see some more hands. I'd like to unmute Jawiria. I'll press one more time, and I don't know why it's not happening. Um. <laughs> Okay. Oh, there we go. Hi. So I just want to add that uh, the society and whatever is going on, uh, going around us, uh, what is happening on social media, whether it is some absurd claim about the vaccines and everything. So there's a lot of noise there. Okay. So if there is an idiot that is running for high office or something like that, then he is or she is writing their own history. So from a historical perspective, if you look at it, you just have to, being a scientist, if, a, uh, if there's a scientist, so they just have to put their opinion first and sort of uh, an informed opinion. So when people look at it, so uh, everybody is responsible to get their source of information, right? So that is why education is very important and uh, the whole scientific temperament is very important to develop, which is a responsibility of the scientist whether they are in uh, one field or the other, unrelated field. So uh, my point is that everybody is writing their own history, whether it's a stupid president or anything like that. So um, our responsibility as like your responsibility, my responsibility as a, not yours, my responsibility as a future researcher would be to put out the opinion, like an informed opinion, which the people would believe to be, okay, this is the correct uh, we can we can rely on that based on the facts. That's about. Thank you. No, thank thank you for the the contribution. Um, I I am uh, slightly su su surprised that the Graham Tay. I've been following a lot of, with interest a lot of his comments um, and surprised that he's not raised his hand because I was hoping <laughs> uh, that he would add to the add to the debate. Um, we're interested again to hear from everyone. Um, there's another twist to this that I, I, I would be very interested to come back to, to, uh, uh, to Lucia uh, about. And so I love the two films you showed. Um, I'm looking forward to the conference. I think it's great to raise the issues. I think mass extinction as well as climate change are, are some of the big challenges of today. I just wanted to, to highlight a, or make one comment and, and invite your response. So um, I, I completely get why you highlighted this by having someone talk about elephants in Africa, because we all understand elephants. I, I don't think most of us would want to see them go extinct. It, it, that, that's something I think you should take on mainstream TV and it would resonate with people. I wonder if it's not even more important, much as I would hate to see elephants go extinct, there, there, there may actually be even bigger problems with the, the thousands of species um, of um, of lower uh, eukaryotes or even prokaryotes that, that are that are being made extinct by the impact of of climate change, which are, are not quite so easy to represent to the public, but may actually, um, in terms of, of biology or even future economies, be be more important. Maybe we'll wipe out a large a large range of organisms that we could find new antibiotics from, or that that actually impact our environment. Um, is it too easy to just focus on polar bears and elephants, or should we also be trying to explain to people that 
the the biome and the, and the whole range of life on Earth is 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 more than that. Yeah, interesting. You've preempted some of our panel discussion on the second day there. Um, but yes, we did. We wanted to really represent a wide range of different animals ecosystems. Um, for example, we've got a whole session on microbes and on soil. Um, so it, it's not just the, the, the kind of media friendly um, uh, animals that we're looking at. Um, but I have to say that that um, that's an interesting part of the discussion. Um, on the second day, as I mentioned, we're looking at I suppose different types of intervention in loss of biodiversity, um, and that means not not just the, the types of solutions that there are, but whether some voices are heard more than others, and is that sort of influenced by the media and you know, where there's a where there's a sellable, um, beautiful uh, picture that can be portrayed. Um, that seems to be the only thing that makes makes the news. And what about, as we mentioned, issues of soil, for example, which we've dedicated quite a long session to, um, which might not be as attractive necessarily and reach the paper. I think that does have a huge influence on how projects are chosen and prioritised and funded by government. So I think that's all interlinked. Um, I think that's maybe where Georgia can add value as well, um, because in a sense, you know, the way that... This environmental, these environmental challenges are, are pictured is hugely affected by media um, power and kind of um, the way that things are represented in the media. Um, so do you think that um, there is a way to sort of change the conversation um, with how those things are portrayed or will it always be the fact that, that they're looking for something that is an easy sell to the public, like, like the elephant sort of image, for example? Yeah, and I, I know, I, I, I hope, you won't mind me putting you on the, on the spot, but I, I see Carmen also is is uh, is is here, who's who's also just before Georgia comes in is Carmen's all, all also working in science communication and just to get a view again from a, um, a, another part of Europe. Um, would you like to comment on any of these uh, issues and the practical difficulty of communicating complicated ideas? Well, I was actually thinking uh, during the, this long hour. Uh, what to say, and I have to say that I didn't know because I was trying to read everything that was uh, written here in the chat and there were coming so many ideas and so many views that it was actually very difficult to me to, to choose something, you know, to to introduce here. I mean, um, I was actually picked by your comment at the beginning about how to fight against the viral you know, messages that we are all uh, receiving, mostly now, of course, about coronavirus, but, but in general. I was also picked by Grafen with uh, his comments about if scientists have the truth or not. I would like him to talk, actually, about that, because uh, from the very beginning, I, I wrote uh, what he was saying. Scientists uh, rarely provide answers. Uh, that was also a very interesting topic because I agree with somebody that wrote after him. I don't know if it was Anja. That you sometimes reply a question, but then you open tones, you know. And I think it's not that we don't have answers; it is that we create questions. But we have the truth in our hands. Maybe we don't, or maybe we cannot claim that we have. But I think we have the tools to try to find the truth. So this, yeah, that's that, that's an excellent... The, the point yeah. that I wanted to bring here in, uh, through this conversation is that, uh, yeah, of course, we all have opinions about very different topics. Maybe the, the topics are not our expertise, but I think what we actually have is the, the way, the set of tools to be able, you know, to to find the proper way to find these these answers that that we like to find, and we have, I think, we have to be activists in the sense to try to teach. I don't know if teaching is the word in this case, but I would say to teach some the the to teach the, the tools that you need and how to use them for you to get your own answers to these questions. We have to create critical thinking. It's not that we have to say how the things are. We have to help people to be able to find uh, by themselves the, the, the answers. I don't think we can claim that we have the truth, but we can 
actually help people to, to find it. Yeah, we certainly don't have the answers to everything. I see Benjamin's got his hand up. Nush, can you... Yeah, I've just unmuted Graham a minute ago, and now he's muted himself again. He was about to say something, Graham. Hey. Hello, Graham. Hi, Angels. Lovely to see you. Thanks, Karen. You too. <laughs> being kind. Um, yeah, my, my, I was a bit disturbed that, that we seem to assume that, that we know everything. We've been bandying words about, like, intellectuals and and the truth, and it's our job to educate. And I'm not sure that's the case at all. I think... As I was saying to Benjamin, schools are supposed to teach us how to think, and science and learning science is supposed to encourage a sense of humility and awareness that we don't really understand everything, and to open our eyes to ask questions, to look at look at things or data in a way that people haven't looked at them before, and to ask questions or make connections that people haven't seen before. I don't see scientists as providing answers to the big issues. That's that's not our job at all. And I think Policymakers should approach scientists for help interpreting data and to get, get insights into what the data may mean. But it's not our job to tell people what to do. It, it's our job to encourage a, a particular way of thinking, a particular way of questioning what we see and, and what we hear. So, um, um, I, I don't think anyone suggested, Graham, um, that scientists know everything, because obviously we tend to be painfully aware of what we don't know. Um, but I mean, certainly we are we are watching an evolving debate take place where, on some sides, the the, the contributions are that the the onset of a five G telephone network is actually the cause of coronavirus, or Bill Gates wants to implant microchips in people, and yes, yeah, so uh, or, or things you know the, the the sea temperature is changing. I mean, there are some things that are amenable to factual measurement and analysis rather than just opinion and we have to keep them separate i mean i think one of the problems in my opinion what one, one of the problems we have as scientists is that there are some things we know a huge amount and can speak with great authority on there are other things where clearly we don't know <laughs> um and and yet society now we live in a society where you want short uh, 140 character answers immediately and you want an answer and, and science can provide those answers um not immediately or, or with authority, but the idea that we teach people how to assess the merits of different information they're provided with seems like a very sensible one. I'm keen to bring as many people in as possible. Benjamin, I know I just hand out and Fatima also. Yeah. So, so Angus, just a quick one. Georgia has to leave, I believe, okay. and Benjamin is able to unmute himself because I've done it for him and he was waiting for Graham. Okay. So if Georgia wants to say goodbye and then we go to Benjamin. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I have to leave. I have to do an interview for, a, for an article writing. But thank you so much for having me. This was a super interesting discussion, and I hope to, you know, um, have a follow up with some of you uh, if you wish to to write privately to me, and that would be great. Um, thank you, okay. thank you, Angus. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, I wanted to say thanks. To them. These discussions are super cool, and Angus, you're doing a fantastic job of running them. Um, I wanted to qualify the point about um, vaccination sort of skeptics a little bit because I think. We're often arguing sort of against these really extreme like nutcases that we sort of have a mental picture of. And I think in actual fact, I think very few people will be that opposed to facts and science. I think uh, in many cases, um, we could argue with vaccination, it's sort of a bit of a game theory issue where um, as an individual, if there is herd immunity, you risk um, complications from a vaccination. So as a parent, um, it's actually not an irrational point to take to to avoid vaccination if it's not strictly necessary, if so long as everyone else is doing it. So it turns into game theory to some extent. Mm -hmm. So I think um, one good way to avoid polarization of opinions and stuff might also be to sort of um, make sure that our mental picture of sort of our anti-scientific opponent is not like a cartoon image. But you know. Yeah, I, I think I think um, I, I agree with that completely. That we often do highlight extreme, um, extreme cartoon-like arguments. Um, it just it just worries me that, that some of these arguments I see um, repeated uh, in in the mainstream media um, and given unnecessary um, attention. But uh, yeah, no, you're right. And of course, there the, the, the can be rational arguments why. 
you might want to avoid a vaccine, or indeed if they rush to create a coronavirus vaccine without enough time for proper testing, there may be some health risks associated and legitimate, reasonable questions to ask about safety if you haven't had time to test it. Um, and we need to distinguish that from people who think it's Bill Gates putting microchips in you for, for control. Fat, Fatima, um, can I ask you to come in? Pressed unmute. I did. I did. No, I just want a little bit to briefly repeat what you actually, Angus, already said in response to Graham. I, I, I agree with Graham that it's not our job to tell people what to do, but I think it's our moral duty to inform people around us and contribute to educate them in, in things that they know less than us, right? In the same way that I trust a doctor, a medical doctor, when I have a health problem, I think people, at least the people that is around me, trust me in, in subjects related to things that I work with. And in fact, I don't know how many of you have had the experience of people asking you directly about these issues, you know, vaccines, uh, you know, any any of these issues uh, and, and, and in a way that you have kind of contributed to clarify their concepts and to, to help them form an opinion. I just wanted to, if, if you can raise this question on, on the poll, you know, how many of you had had this experience? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Peter, can you can you put that up as a question? And we, we don't need to put it up as a question. You can all look at your chat, and there's a yes, no, and if yeah, you I, can, yeah, we yeah. can tell you. That's the quickest way of answering that. In fact, okay. Fatima, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. So, how many of you have been approached by people surrounding you to clarify concepts uh, in order for them to make a decision on vaccines on whatever thing that you know? Uh, in principle, better than them. So you've been approached because you're a scientist. And if, if, if so far four people, three people have said yes, one person no, but there's 35 people online. So if you haven't clicked on participants, that's where you see the panel on the right. The yes has gone up to eight, nine. The no's are on one. Um, where are these? Yeah, so I, it looks to me like 15 people are saying yeah, sixteen people are saying yeah. So I think clearly, Fatima, a lot of people agree with you. I think with this, we actually, in a way, contribute to to counter that. Um, yeah, you know, movements based on ignorance. Yes, um, I, I think it's. Um, I think this this has been a really exciting debate from from my perception, and um, definitely it's gone in a few directions. Made me think about some things. I mean, I. I definitely have a concern in and in, in the society I'm directly living in that the institution I work for it comes it comes back to Freddie's point about feeling he has complete confidence in 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 having any opinion he wants. I, I think our um, academic institutions, at least in the UK, um, are managed by people who feel very vulnerable to social media, and I I think that some of the people in in, in central administration are, are really terrified that some some something will be said that creates a social media campaign that means that it will affect their funding or it will affect their reputation in some way and I, I i i have some concerns that that has changed dramatically in recent years in a way that is in practice working to undermine our confidence in expressing an opinion or being controversial um, and uh, that's a slightly different topic to what we've been discussing, but maybe something for uh, another another day. Uh, I I I wonder if that's true in other countries, or if you feel it's not the case that in Germany, for example, Freddie, do you think that's a, an issue? Is is uh, is are German universities concerned about social media or not? <laughs> I I don't I don't think as much as in the UK and in the US. But I think that's also because we haven't had these cases, uh, you know, like, like your, what a Tim 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 uh, Hunt, uh, Hunt yeah. making a, you know, trying to be funny, right? Yeah. And I guess nobody ever told him that he's actually not funny, and then he made that one joke that went bad, and it, it caused a Twitter storm. And before he got out of the plane, he was rejected by his university. Uh, this could never happen here. Well, I don't know. I'm not going to say never happened, but 
we've had a, a full blown scandal at our university because of just some really badly done science. And, you know, they kicked everybody out but the professor. Um, so that, you know, Nuj knows what I'm talking about, right? The, the, the blood test scandal thing. Um, yeah. So, so I guess there is concern about things going bad, of course, but I don't think that is, it's the same with the animal. You know, I mean, in the UK, since 30 years, you have this, this, this crazy people who do really a, a crap animal uh, activism. We haven't had this that badly here, right? So I, I guess it's a it's probably a cultural thing. It might have to do if the government tells us to do stuff, and we unfortunately do what they tell us, right? That so it's not all good. Um, yeah, maybe you're just more sensible. <laughs> There's a swings, swings, swings and roundabouts. Would anyone uh, else like to come in or contribute? I I see Gareth. Sure. So my first comment is that if um, Angus went on CNN tonight and said very with passion that the world is flat, you would have fans by the next day. <laughs> Any of them would be Trump supporters. I, I think there is a an evil force in the social network business. There's a fantastic video on Netflix called Social Dilemma, which explains how this system is working against us or so. I mean, I just want to make a comment about the, the vaccine, the the problem with the vaccines. I mean, it, it started with this guy called Andrew Wakefield in 2004, who claimed in, in a paper in The Lancet of all places, uh, the link between the measles vaccine and autism. That was debunked. He was eventually struck off the register for fraud, but he's still going strong in the States. He's got a, I think in Texas, he's got a, a prax, pra, uh, praxis, practice. And um, they will always be supporters on our social, social networks, always fighting against us. Um, the Obama was not born in the US, Holocaust denials. I mean, how can these people believe this? But they do believe it, or they pretend to believe it. And this social network is, is a force which wasn't with us 20 years ago. And it's, if you look at this, this doc documentary written by, made by people who had worked for the Google and Facebook and these people and these companies that um, are manipulating us, and these are people that were involved in making the algorithms to begin with, who now have changed their minds or so and see it as a force for destruction. So, and it, it, it's rather depressing. So, is there a way we can, uh, instead of abandoning the social media landscape to um, uh, people to, to push wilder views, whether we, uh, for example, in the Alumni Association, could do more to, to be. Uh, able to put out more rational views and earn trust. Is this an opportunity for us? There's maybe something to, to think about. Um, can we do more? Rome goes so fast, right? And there's always people who are on the fringes who want to believe in any old rubbish. And um, I you know, think uh, they, these people will always be there. No, they, they will. I, I, I absolutely agree with you, Gareth. So I, I think there's no point in imagining they won't be there, but at least pro providing a source of, of rational, confidence-inspiring, sen sensible information. Yeah. Maybe that I'm just suggesting, maybe that's something that we can actually help to do. I mean, for the measles vaccine, so people saw that what happened when people, when people stopped taking their children to be vaccinated, the, 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 the disease went up greatly. So, so sensible people should notice it. But there's a lot of so-called normal middle-class people who don't want to take their children to be vaccinated for measles, yeah. right? Just to finish that, that, that's great, because I just, yeah, you reminded me that time, time has gone on. I am amazed that an hour and a half has flown past already. So uh, I really enjoyed the, the discussion. A lot to go away and think about. And I hope, um, yeah, that more of you will uh, uh, contribute and, and volunteer to come and take part in the, the discussions and prepare uh, thoughts and ideas. And so we look forward to having the, the, the next event and seeing you there. Thank you.